the cost of living is going up, quality of life is going down, and we're not seeing the industries where our kids can stay here and afford to live here. They're gonna, we're gonna export them out. We're gonna raise them. We're gonna educate them, and then we're, they're gonna go to other parts of this country. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I'm a dad. I don't want that. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the 435 Podcast. I'm your host, Robert McFarlane. And today's guest, former Speaker of the House for the state of Utah, Greg Hughes. He ran for governor. He ran against uh, uh, Congressman Malloy in the special election. He has a great insider's view on a lot of stuff. And this is a long one, folks. So you're going to have to buckle in. We talked about no gov internet, uh, some, some issues I had no idea were going on. And we also talked about infrastructure, housing. He has a great perspective because he's been a public servant almost his entire life. A couple of events coming up this fall. We have, uh, I'm speaking at the Housing Action Coalition Forum at Black Desert Convention Center. You're going to want to come to this one October 30th. It's from 9 a.m. till 1. Obviously, people work on a middle in the middle of the week, but uh, it's definitely going to be a great forum talking about housing in Southern Utah. I'm going to be speaking at a panel there, and it, we're, I'm also going to be at the Rise Summit. That's on September 5th. Yep, that's a Thursday, everybody. Another in the middle of the day. We're going to be talking about housing there. I'm going to be meeting with Stacy Young. We're actually going to have a live episode of that one. So if you don't go to that one, you can check it on the podcast. Uh, other than that, big shout out to our sponsors, Blue Form Media, FS Coffee Company, Tuacon Amphitheater, Real Estate 435, Real Estate Experts in Southern Utah. All of us are here to help you in the community. Enjoy this episode, guys. We'll see you out there. Dave Smith, you were talking about how it's a distraction. It could be. It can, it can be a big distraction. Yeah. And so he, he made this statement uh, the other day and I actually, I talked to Celeste, Celeste Malloy was here mm -hmm. yesterday yeah, and I talked to her about this, about how we have outrage is a finite resource. We, we shouldn't be getting outraged about everything. Mm -hmm. we, sh we should really be focusing on what are, what are the, the most important things that we should be outraged on. And then we have to have tenacity to run that thing all the way to the finish line. We can't just like give up halfway along the line, yes. right? If, yep. if you look at like the macro stage, like Epstein and all that stuff or the assassination on Trump, like we can figure that out. But basically two weeks after the Trump assassination attempt, the entire right portion of the government got hyper-focused on the Olympics and the, and the, the trans stuff at the Olympics. Yeah. And it's like the whole yeah. news cycle just switched instantly. Yeah. And, and over, and look, over, I, yeah, it's, it's outraging. It's, it's yeah, it's sad. Stupid, and and I, I think we're all entitled to to draw conclusions and and see things. Like I'm a big I'm I'm a big boxing fan. I I did a little boxing and amateur boxing. I was never any good, but I stay involved in the sport. Yeah, and I watch that. And I and I uh, so I don't. I was unaware of any real nose fractures in amateur boxing it's a it's a sport that's scored differently where it's mm -hmm. more scoring blows than power punches and yeah you're not, I, not necessarily trying to knock somebody no, out so there's not a lot of power in amateur uh boxing and so i i watched that i had my opinions but to your point i'm entitled to recoil or see what i'm seeing and go is this a level playing field but, but am i is it the is it a kitchen table issue right now that's going to impact our lives our children grandchildren right. whoever no i mean I, we just got to I think you're right. I think we have to. It's like a third page. If it was like an old newspaper, it'd be like maybe on the, uh, yes. maybe just the sports section. <laughs> Does it have to be on the front page? We can't fit it all on the front page. And and again, I don't want anyone to hear me say, I'm not dismissive of, of critical issues. I think we should have a concern, but you only have so much bandwidth and there, there's only so much we can coalesce around in terms of what are the most imminent threats to our liberties, our self-determination, things like that. Let's, uh, so I, I just worry sometimes some of this stuff is almost like chumming the water. People throw things at us to get us distracted to look while other things are going on that well, I think might be worse. Well, and I think, you know, you had this centralized media for the better part of 50 years, right? As soon as the television, you know, you, you go back to the, the Nixon Kennedy debate mm -hmm. and you have, you know, Walter Cronkite and you have these, these massive news outlets that solidify into basically like six categories there's like six major media networks it used to be the newspaper then it moved to the tv and that dominated and now we're starting to transition where media and news and information is getting fractured and and yep decentralized self-selective you can you go to the sources you trust you go to the sources that you prefer and 
they're not uniformly the same at all. Exactly. So that's where, you know, when Dave was talking about that, I was like, this is, this is why I do the podcast. This is the 435 podcast because it's what are issues that we can stay focused on that are important in Southern Utah. And yeah, there's macro things that do affect us, but am I going to sit here and have in-depth conversation about the war in Ukraine? I mean, yeah. is there really anybody in our County that is going to have a meaningful impact on what's happening over there? No. Yeah. So is it, is it worth, are we staying focused on that? It's a massive issue that I think is going ignored. Like the, the bubbling mm-hmm. of both Israel What's, what's happening in Israel and Palestine and Ukraine and Russia, they're, they're blending together. And I look back at old war, world wars and we were like almost 10 months into World War II before they started calling it World War II. You know what I mean? They were almost a full year. That, yeah. And so um, we think the war started when we got in it. That's not what happened, Mm-mm. right? And no. so talk to England, they'll tell you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or France, France or yeah. any, anywhere else, right? So so when I think of these moments in history when we're in the middle of it and then you're not seeing news articles about it and you only listen to those selective people that I know are paying attention on a daily basis, I'm like, man, this is getting bad and it's weird that nobody else talks about it. So for me, would it be great to talk about it? Yeah, I think it's it's awesome, but it's also super complicated and yeah. what can I do about it? Yep. Right? I, I mean, and I saw, I look, I, I, I get a little bipolar on this myself because I spent all this time in politics. I got elected in 2002. I, I, re, I came from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I got involved in the Bush quail 1988 presidential campaign in mm. Pennsylvania. It was a targeted state, uh, in its state office. And I just liked being involved in something that was bigger than me. That I really wanted to see crazy. him. Yeah. And I got a lot, I was just out of high school, but I got a lot of responsibility because I was willing to do a lot of work and, it really shaped even why I'm sitting in front of you right now, the, those experiences right out of high school um, in all that time. Um, and I uniquely got to meet George uh, Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Bush and his brothers. And, and um, I, I was completely oblivious to any what they call deep state. I don't know how deep it is anymore, but there were things going on that I think even the, in the first uh, Trump presidency that I was ignorant to i did not see i did not know we could be energy independent in less than two years i thought we could lower dependency on on oil Mm -hmm. and but we could we were a net exporter and not a lot of time at all and why was that the case um the war is that i always want i was a hawk you know you keep the fight out there so it never reaches your shores until i realized that you don't have to be engaged in a world war or in, in foreign conflicts and you can be safe still and, and still you can safe, still yeah. project that strength and keep mm-hmm. peace. Didn't know that. And so I still, th- I think about those things. Those aren't four, three, five podcast moments for you yeah. or me uh, here, but it all kind of connects in some way. So there's some things that as I've gotten older, I've marveled that I, there were things going right over my head that I feel that, that I didn't, uh, I wasn't uh, tracking as yeah. well. Yeah. So that gets me thinking too, but Again, I don't have enough bandwidth to make that my clarion call yeah. every day. So well, and and that's that's the beauty of the Republican system, the or the Republic system that we have, right? We're a, a federal republic, and we delegate a lot of those responsibilities out to the yes. people that can uh, have the capacity to do those things. Yep. And even talking to Celeste, right? She she was uh, maybe a little hyperbolic about it, but she's like, I got ten hours of sleep in the last week, but yeah. she also ran for office for 15 months straight yes. you know she ran a for a special deal. special election and then she turned around and had to run again yes. and it was a rough rough campaign and so she's doing that and also she's sitting on two subcommittees in congress and having to show up for sessions and there's 3500 bills or however many hundreds of you know thousands of bills that are coming through the congress in any given year it's a lot it's it a, is it is a lot it is it is and um I love the accountability of elections. I think that they they should, uh, you know, high information election cycles. We have to have them somehow. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want everything to just be, you know, yard signs and flyers. You need you need to have dialogue like you're having with uh, Congresswoman Malloy. So I love that part. But you know, as we as communication gets stronger, you get a lot of critics, and it's almost like um, you know you get the it's like you're under siege yeah. all the time. Yeah. So you being a part of the the state legislature 16 years right mm-hmm. so you what what caused you to get out in 2018 what was that 
transition because yeah, so, I think you ran for CD2, right? Yeah, you I ran a, a special election. You ran I ran special. for governor in 2020 before that. Oh, that's that. right. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, I, I did do some research. But I did, uh, but, but you don't have to. It's it's very low name ID. I realized when I got out of the legislature after 16 years, it was like a cloaking device. Nobody knew who I was. I thought because I'd been criticized in the media and stuff that that, that would uh, be out there, but it, it wasn't as much. Uh, so I served a, a 16 years in our legislature. I was uh, two terms or four years as our House Majority Whip, and then I served two terms as the Speaker of the House. Okay. And um, and I'll tell you that uh, two terms as uh, a being Speaker is kind of a precedent. I mean, it's it was always one term, and then in the late 90s that you know a Speaker ran for a second term. And I think Brad Wilson uh, ran for and uh, successfully a third term for Speaker. So it's no there's no hard and fast rule. But what I found is after four years of being speaker, the, the, the tank was empty. It's a part, it's supposed to be a part-time legislature, but that's not supposed to be 12 hours out of your 24 hour day. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was time. And it's, and I, that's what I love about our state legislature is because it's, it's designed to be a citizen legislature. You're in session seven and a half weeks, a mm-hmm. general session, seven and a half weeks a year. You're doing the budget, you're doing bills, you have your interim committees and, in, you know, during the year. But it was really designed, the framers of our state constitution wanted people that are in the world, that they're working, that they're raising a family, that they that they don't become isolated, that mm-hmm. they don't become full time at this. And uh, that's, so what happens is the more you know, the more you do, the more you do, the more it pulls you away from what really pays your bills, your jobs, your, and, yeah. and things. And so there is, there's just a, a higher turnover, I think, than people would imagine in our state legislature, just because of the nature of how it's uh, designed and and how much time it takes from you when you're you're supposed to be there part time and you have other commitments and obligations. What do you think uh, the role of how big government has got? Just I mean, from the state to the government, you know, you think of the framers w- when you were talking about how it was a part time legislature and the the setting it up. Well, back then the government wasn't involved in all these. Yes, like. They're, they didn't have their hands in literally every aspect of society yeah. and the economy. I think I, I heard and somebody fact checked me, but um, I think 30 percent of our economic uh, our economy is directly um, influenced by federal spending. So 30 yeah. percent of our in- economy would would go under that. And I think uh, tangentially, um, maybe a second order uh, influence is like 40 percent of the country. By just the federal government alone. It's it's a sad statistic, and I think it's right. In fact, if you take the job reports that keep coming out, where when people say, look how many new jobs we've received or that have been created, the the percentage of those that are government jobs is more than I think the everyday citizen would, would understand. And it's not good. It's not healthy. It's, yeah. it's not the way it was designed. Now, some of Utah's growth is going to be population. You know, like the first budget – I think the first budget in 2003, so I got elected in November of two, January of 03 was my first session. I think it was like a six or six or $7 billion budget. It's over 20 billion today. Um, uh, you know, but the population has grown incredibly during that time as well. So you have population growth, but um, I, I'm watching the legislature now and there's more staff that's starting to uh, show up uh, be, uh, for committee chairs and things. And I honestly, Robert, I don't know that that's a good thing. Uh, what I liked about the state legislature is you could learn and do as much as you want, or you can go to committee as per your calendar and you can listen to bills and vote yes or no. Uh, you don't have to sponsor anything. It really is up to you as a lawmaker, how much in that process you want to engage or not. And so that became a refiner's fire. People that learned the process, they learned the rules, how things work. Uh, became very effective. Some people didn't have that natural curiosity, and so they didn't as much. Yeah. When you get staff to start running everything, yeah. there's almost like a equity of outcome, like equal outcome mm-hmm. instead of uh, equal opportunity. And mm-hmm. then lawmakers lean in as much as they want. I, I do worry about that. I worry about staff running uh, legislatures more so than lawmakers. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and and the thought would be, well, we need, we need more staff because we need help because this it's, this shouldn't be 12 out of the 24 hour yeah. days. Yep. We need help so I can have some kind of quality of life. If I'm, if I'm a politician and I'm, a, I, 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 on the one hand, I can understand that. And on the other hand, I could, I'm thinking, 
well, stop making the government be involved in so many things <laughs> yeah. and yeah. let let just the market do their thing and you wouldn't have to be yeah. spending hours and hours and hours and, talking about this. And I didn't get to that 12 hours out of 24 and that's, you know, I'm, I'm being, We're being a, yeah, a little bit more But, but it, is, it is incredibly consuming. But that was when I was speaker and it was even a big jump from being majority whip to speak. They weren't even close to the same job. Um, and I, I don't, I do, I agree with you. I think that um, there is a, there is a beauty and there is a wisdom in having people that are there just part-time and do as much as you can in that time that you have. And inherently it limits you or should yeah. limit you. And you shouldn't try to expand that out because again, if you look at the states that have full-time legislatures, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, California, I don't think, I don't think those are best practices in yeah. terms of their tax burden, uh, regulatory climate, all that. So yeah. that's interesting. So you, yeah. so you ran for governor, you ran for in the special election. Um, was that kind of getting out in 2018? Was that to prepare to run in? Yeah. In, I, 2020? in 2018, I was finishing up that second term as speaker. And I, and I remember thinking I could maybe do another term as speaker, but then I would be a hundred percent finished or I could retire and which in two terms was kind of the practice. And then look at maybe running for governor and, and have that opportunity. And I decided to do that and I don't regret it. I didn't win, but it was a crazy year in 20. Um, it was wild. I like being around people. I love town halls. I love, uh, ask people asking hard questions and having to give honest answers. Mm -hmm. Um, in COVID it's like a bad James Bond movie. We got pushed into, we had to go in our houses. We weren't allowed to come out. We weren't allowed to see people. Yeah. Um, just, it was, it was a crazy year, but in that, I had spent so much time in the legislature and in, on rural issues, water, lands, been back to D.C. to explain Utah's perspective on our lands issues and mm -hmm. our relationship with the federal government managing 65% of Utah's yeah. land and uh, how we're kind of penned in. Um, but I learned so much more running for governor. I, I, I just in every county, when you meet in those town halls and you hear people's uh, perspective, uh, it was, it was really good. I had, my daughter was with me too, and it was a, a great experience for us, but I don't regret it. I learned, I learned so much. Um, I felt like I came out better than I went in. I think my issues actually, uh, got more refined and more relevant, uh, mm -hmm. going through a campaign like that, listening to people and hearing the questions. So I, it was a, it was a good, I liked it. Yeah. So I, I, I appreciate that I ran, even if I didn't win. Um, I always say we won, I think 10 counties. So I, that's my glass half full. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, 10 won counties this county. Good. So you won, you, you, that's good. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. So, um, a lot of people tell me all the time, no, nah, I want to go back. I want to go back. Okay. What, what, uh, what was the impetus of getting into like involved, like back in 2003, 2002, Two, 2002, 2002, 2002, what, what, what it actually starts after that high school year in, uh, in Pittsburgh where I volunteered on the presidential campaign. Okay. Yeah. Right. Found myself oh my gosh, in there to me office. in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania during a presidential campaign, especially that one could, in my mind, it was probably just the most wild. There's it, so much, the, the learning curve was probably so steep. It was. And back then. This, this ages me, but you know, I'm old. I, I have to accept it. I, we didn't have the internet. We I graduated high school in 05. So, okay. so I graduated in 88, Okay, but we, there's no, there's no, there aren't computers or anything. So while in this state office, you have filing cabinets and mm -hmm. in those filing cabinets are George Herbert. While he was vice president, he's running for president. Mm -hmm. Um, all the issues in alphabetical order in files, like on white paper. Right. So if you, if someone has a question about an issue, you just go to the filing cabinet. You got to go alphabetically to get to that issue. Yeah. Well, I'm working on that campaign. I'm 18. I'm out of, I don't, my, my worldview is not set. I, I, I grew up very poor. My mother was a single mother. I watched the unions uh, really crumble in that, in those eighties. And, uh, you know, it, and I saw a lot of hardship. I was a bellhop at the Sheraton. A lot of the maintenance people had been making really good living, uh, in the steel industry, but now were maintenance at hotels because they were laid off and weren't able to get their jobs back. It was a tough time in mm. Southwest Pennsylvania. So I was, I was drawing from those experiences and, and, and making, having some conclusions, but, but anyway, I would sit at night and I would open those filing cabinets and I would just, re just go through the alphabetical order and I would just read these positions and I'd go, well, do I agree with that? 
what do I think about? And it, some of them I didn't even know were issues. You're in high I, school. This is after, it's after I graduated. Okay, so after it's the graduated. summer after I graduated from but high still, school. But still, okay. So yeah, you're 18. But yeah. yeah, so I'm just reading through this and I'm just, I'm being introduced to new issues and, 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 and things you hadn't considered for yeah, sure. Yeah. And I wasn't just an amen corner to everything I read. I was like, well, wait a minute. And I, but it, but it was getting my mind working. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then on the practical level, uh, if you're ready to work and you're going to work hard, there's a lot, there was a lot of opportunity in that race, uh, in that year in Pennsylvania. So they would send me up to Erie, Pennsylvania, two hours North to, uh, uh, organize a fundraiser for, uh, Dan Quayle. That mm-hmm. was his vice presidential nominee on the ticket. And I, I would work with their, their member of Congress or their con- congressional campaign member to have a, like a fundraiser or something. Cause it was, you get, you get like a three or four day notice that this was going to happen. They're, yeah. they're coming in, you got to move. And I'm getting interviewed on the radio as like the Bush quail, uh, campaign person, state person. And I'm thinking to myself, cause I, I grew up in very, um, you know, humble or unremarkable circumstances. And then right. to be involved in something that's so much bigger than myself, mm-hmm. uh, and, and to be engaged in it. And it was, I just loved it. And, and I think. Robert, honestly, from that experience, it was the something bigger than myself. And mm-hmm. I, I truly believed in, he won Pennsylvania that year and mm-hmm. no, a Republican didn't win Pennsylvania again till Trump in 16, Whoa. but yeah. And, uh, but he won Pennsylvania and, uh, it was just an incredible, it was a, it was a life, uh, forming experience for me. And I then worked on other campaigns. I worked, Enid Green ran for Congress in 92 and 94, and I okay. moved to Utah. So my mother was a convert to the LDS church, and no one in my family was LDS. And Pittsburgh's kind of a, it's a drinking town with a football problem. Okay. okay. So, I mean, all my buddies, everybody, I mean, when you, I mean, everybody drinks. I actually, I went on a church mission. I went to Australia and Papua New Guinea. When I got back, all my friends are at the bars and they're enjoying their early 20s. And I felt like a little bit of a fish out of water. And when you're a, when you're a Mormon in Pittsburgh, you may as well be Amish. People's they've never heard of Mormons. They yeah. don't even know what it is. Yeah. And so I had some friends uh, that were of the same faith that had come to Utah to go to BYU, uh-huh. uh, and so they had a house, the Pittsburgh house. Anyway, I come back here. I I, I I'm the pioneer in my family. I I drove out here in a mm-hmm. Suzuki Samurai and uh, in '91. <laughs> nice and, uh, sick car. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, I um. I, I got involved right away and because of my experience in 88. I mm-hmm. went on, the inaugural ball was in 89 in January. And, in February, and you got a great resume. You're like, I went, hey, I, went, I helped them win Pennsylvania. Yep, Here I went go. right into the mission. I got back in 91. And uh, I thought I'd actually go back to Pennsylvania and work on the reelect. But I met Ina Green. She was running for Congress and helped her. She did not win in 92, but she ran again in 94. I worked on that campaign and she won. Anyway, it's just kind of like. Um, uh, was well, she I, challenging an incumbent? So it was an open seat in 92 and uh, the Democrat, Karen Shepard won, uh, but uh, she voted to increase taxes when she had committed to not to, not to do that. So the next year, the next, it was, they had that race again and Enid had won. And um, I, I I call it like Forrest Gump or life by Braille. I, none of this was really mapped out for me. It's just things that I think most people, when they're honest with themselves, (laughs) <laughs> They're, like the, the very vast majority of people, nothing was mapped out. When, when yeah. nobody's where they thought they were going to yeah. be, yeah. I, that that would be me. In a million years, I would yeah. never, <clears throat> I would have never guessed I was moving to St. George, Utah. I, I would have never guessed I, I landed here. Where are you from run. originally? So, uh, excuse me, uh, I was born up in Sandy. Yeah, and I went through ninth grade uh, in the public school there. My dad was in the National Guard mm-hmm. and served thirty plus military thirty years plus in the army. And he was an instructor, NCO. And my mom was a uh, uh, an attorney for a sec. She was the secretary for an attorney's office throughout. She was just a legal secretary, which back in the day it was it wasn't like, you know, there's uh, what are the you're not a lawyer paralegal. It was before yeah. paralegals and stuff. But yeah. she did everything. She did yeah. you know court reporting. She did all that stuff. So I was always fascinated with law, and I ended up going to a military school in Roswell, New Mexico, for nice. jun or, or for college and junior college, and I went there because. I felt like a fish out of water in, um, you know, went to Crescent View Middle, uh, Crescent <laughs> Crescent View Middle School, and I was really one of the only non Mormon kids, and I grew right. up non Mormon, and I always felt like, I, 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 why don't I have very many friends? And I didn't realize till it was later. It wasn't that I was getting excluded. It's just that in the LDS culture, you're like 
everybody who's in the ward, you're all part of family. And then you spend all of your time with those yeah. people. It's not like it's yeah. not like I don't want another person in my world. It's like we only have 24 hours in a day and I got lots of friends and and, you know, the kids' parents had lots of friends that they grew up with, and so my parents weren't their friends. And and it's it's good you see that. I mean, I I, I experienced that. So uh, the predominant faith in the only where just I grew up flipped almost, was right? Roman Catholic, right? So you got you got yeah. CCD, which was like uh, uh, I don't know, it'd be like seminary, I guess, but it was uh-huh. once a week. It was a Bible class that all the kids went to CCD, and then First Communion was a huge event and a big party. And mm-hmm. I wasn't invited. I would, or kids would talk about those things that they had been experiencing together that I wasn't a part of. And you and then and as a kid too, it's not like oh, um, you're not inviting me. No. Or I could go to that, but yeah. you're like, well, I'm not that. So I guess I'm just not. It's just, yeah, I think right? it's just social science. I think it's human beings so are very predictable on how they act that way. And, and, but that said, I think one of the rate, my children now are adults, 25, uh, technically 25, 22 and 20, but it was really good for us to get back home and mm-hmm. to have family that weren't of the same faith as we had Funny story, maybe this is, I'm just digressing too much, but my youngest, when he was young, uh, we went to my Aunt Patty and Uncle Denny's. My Uncle Denny's smoking. He's, oh, I've never not seen my Uncle Denny without a burning cigarette in his hand. He's just always smoked. And my son just broke, he was just small, but he started to just cry. And he's like, Uncle Denny, you're going to die. You're smoking. Because he'd heard that smoking causes yeah. cancer. But in my in his little mind, he thought that, man, as soon as that cigarette's done, he's going to keel over. Yeah. And I'm like, buddy, come here, come here. It's like in 40 years or something. It's going to be a while. Don't, don't, worry. It's, don't worry. It's fine. It's really, it's really, it's fine. So then my aunt is keeping my uncle from smoking around my, my son. And so it doesn't upset him. And, but you know, that's a, a, my point, I guess, is just that with my children being able to see uh, people that whose upbringings were different or mm-hmm. uh, we, I just think it helped uh, yeah. and it's helped broaden their, uh, their perspective and empathy. Yeah, for other people, and it's been good. And our family, we love our family back in Pittsburgh. And so, anyway. it, it, I mean, these are kind of some of the dynamics, right? That we're all living with. You know, we think we're unique. I think I had a weird experience when I was a kid, but you had the almost the exact same experience, <laughs> just in the exact opposite way, which is crazy yeah. to me, which is funny to me. But yeah. it also leads us to where we're going. But because of that fish out of water, I go to a military. It's a private military school. Yeah. It's thirteen hours away. I didn't know anyone. My parents literally dropped me off and then drove thirteen hours back to Salt Lake, and wow. I was there. I didn't. I couldn't talk to him for. There's twenty one days where no, you know, no phone calls, no emails, no, no anything. You can write letters. Mm-hmm. So the first twenty one days, and then for the first semester, essentially, we can't leave post. We could have a phone, but there's not really any other privileges. You kind of had to earn privileges yeah. along the way. But you know, I went from seeing my parents every single day and maybe a church camp, like maybe a week long camp that I was gone at one point. To I didn't see my parents for three months. Wow. And so. That How kind old of were you? 15. Okay. 15. So I wasn't that young, especially when you look at the founders of the country and you think like, you know. Isn't that J- crazy when uh, you look at John those Adams, ages? John Adams went to Harvard, I believe, when he was 14 years old and oh, he's wow. going to Harvard and he literally walked there and you know what I mean? So yeah. th- th- I'm not unique in that 15, but culturally that's pretty unique because people my age, that experience doesn't quite exist very much anymore, but it made me kind of an adventurer, right? It made me kind of want to, okay, I want to explore the world. So I backpacked Europe. You know, I went to uh, yeah, that's cool. Cal State Fullerton for my undergrad and got a political science degree because that was what I was interested in. Yeah. Everybody says, oh, just do what you're interested in yeah. and then you'll make money. And then now I'm a real estate agent, which is See? not where I plan to be. <laughs> But but so it is. It all comes full circle, and I'm talking politics still now at 37. And you so. should be. I think I think that this is is in 2024, and the, our conduits of communication. I think these podcasts have become absolutely critical because yeah. these are not. You don't have to compress it into a segment. You don't have to try and say. You don't have to. Boil, we have to have this agenda inside like, of. 10 we, minutes. we brought the no gov internet, and it's yeah. like we we could just talk about this for 15 minutes, but then nobody will know anything about you. Yeah. And then there's not any context to it. And so. there's a bandwidth for podcasts, which I'm surprised at. I always thought people's attention spans were uh, decreasing because of the internet, social media and things. But podcasts have, are seeing such great success. And look, I do a podcast or I did, I used to do a podcast on uh, KUTV on Fridays with, uh, with Heidi Hatch and a Democrat, Mark Carabello, and I'm the Republican. And 
you know, we didn't do a ton of prep. We just did this and we, we talk about these issues, uh, that gone, have gone on each week and I loved it. I love that podcast. And so I do love this format. It's, yeah. Uh, it's important that leaders like you have these great followings and have podcasts. Yeah. And, and now that it's on the internet too, it's there and it's stuck there. I think yeah. like the radio shows, I was like, man, I wish I could have like gone back and seen the video of you on the radio, Yeah, you know, back in the day, which now, now that's going to be the case. Right. So yeah. I think of all these next that digital you know, footprint that, that digital have then. footprint. Yeah. So, um, you got into development. In yeah. So, estate? so again, the Forrest Gump. We're going back to life like, yeah. by Braille. I'm yep. on a campaign. I'm working with uh, uh, on Ian Green's cam- congressional campaign. Okay. And one of the gentlemen that I met that was on that campaign, he had just graduated from Oxford with a master's degree in uh, economics, and uh, he had this entrepreneurial spirit. He wanted to do something. And when the campaign ended, this is actually after the '92 campaign ended. We'd worked really well together, and um, I was going to. Uh, I was just finishing up UVSC and and going to now transferring to BYU. And uh, I said, we had to start a bit. I mean, he wanted to, he was looking at a business. He just finished his master's degree and real estate, even in the early nineties, 92, 93 was, was like, it's been, it started it's, cranking up. Yeah. It started going well. So especially down um, here in Southern Utah. Yeah. Well up there, we, we, um, we built a couple of homes and sold them and we got our contractor's license and it's a, I'm, I'm going quickly through it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Some of the homes we sold, we look a couple of years later at the equity in those and thought, you know, we ought to build and keep, not yeah. build and sell. And so we looked at apartments, didn't know a lot about it, bought an old building, uh, fixed it up, uh, and then started finding parcels uh, in Salt Lake City, smaller parcels where we could build 12 units, 14 units, and uh, really grew it. And yeah. it's the same business I have today. Uh, and it's all it's small. It's not in the scale of some people I know. Um, they build large, large developments. These are more infill developments, but, uh, Gary and I are like brothers. My, my business partner, we met in our twenties. We were two single guys. He's now got three married with three children. I'm married three children. So we've kind of grown up together in that. And he was re- really cool about when I, cause we met on a political campaign when I said, I want to run for this legislature. You know, it's not that much time. It's seven and a half weeks a year. It's, it's easy. Mm-hmm. Um, he was real supportive of me being able to do that. And then as it took more and more, the more, you know, the more you do, as it encroached on more of my time in our business, he was just, he had my back. He just didn't really uh, push hard with the irony being when I was done and I came to work and I'm like, I'm ready to put in 40 hours, but brother, I'm back. I'm back. He's like, man, you got a lot of opinions. You, know, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to actually come in here every day. <laughs> I'm like, I've been feeling so guilty about this. So anyway, I want to help us. Yeah. Come let on. me help you. He's like, yeah, so we, nah, you're kind of messing it all up. Yeah. You've been away for a while. Yeah, but anyway, but, uh, but no, so that development, I've, that's, uh, that's Hughes really construction. My day job. Is that? No, 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 I'm not related that's, to that. That's Hughes. a different one. Yeah. So yeah. what's, what's the, uh, it's a, it's a crown stone was, a, was our, uh, our, our, con, our general contracting, uh, company, but we have urban chase property management. So okay. we, the, we've built about eight buildings. We have about 140 total units over the different buildings. Mm-hmm. And uh, Urban Chase Property Management is we just manage our own properties. Okay. And uh, we used to build uh, new. And then um, I think right after the Great Recession, oh, wait. Uh, it just, it, it, it was just, we didn't lose anything. We weren't over leveraged, but that, those were, we, that was, those were tougher times. And I think it just, the appetite to extend and to leverage just kind of waned with Gary while I was starting to get more and more into public service. Mm-hmm. And so we just, we have these properties that we, we own and op- own and operate. Manage. So, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, now post, uh, post holding office life. Yes. So since 2018, what is, what has been your focus outside? You've ran a couple of <laughs> other campaigns, but what, what other projects are you working on? Cause you, so, I, the, the no government internet, no gov internet.com, um, Domestic Policy Caucus. Yeah. So you're you're trying to raise awareness for this. Mm-hmm. That's and one thing I do. I, I I hadn't I hadn't heard about it until uh, Leslie, right? Yes, she yeah. reached out to me, and I was like, "This is actually super fascinating." Like, I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't. So, well, I was. I thought I was for a guy that in too. Kind of takes some pride in like knowing what's going yes. on. When I see things where I'm like, "Oh man, I should have known about this before," but. Yeah, no, so it I, is I actually crept up attention. on us. I think it's why I was really interested in taking this on is because it's an issue that I felt like I was dialed in on the issues that were going on. And I, I had not seen this encroachment of government I mean, cities uh, paying for bonding force, uh, guaranteeing the, the cost for broadband infrastructure or broadband internet. And uh, 
in the face of having private sector that's doing the same work. And and it's and we can get that's, those I think details, that's different but, than like bonds for parks and rec. Correct. Right. So like I I think um I am traditionally speaking against any government bonds to do any yeah private you know the private business should be able to do this thing if there is enough of a need for it where parks and recreation i can i totally can see how there's no real private incentive to right. have a park right, right. Like you're not competing against the other parks and, and exactly that's, we used to call that the phone book test when we used to have phone books but mm -hmm. uh, yeah if, if you have a private sector we live in a free market if we have and there's supply and demand mm -hmm. and we have smart there's smart people out there if there's a demand um and especially when it's directly to the city where you go to the citizens and say, do you want this? And they all say, yes, we want this. 76%, you yeah. know, and St. George passed that bond. Yeah. It's like, okay, clearly they want it. But, but in business, if you have something that say our citizenry or people that you represent say, look, I, I need, we're depending more and more on technology, high speed internet. Um, we're streaming. I have YouTube TV now. I used to have direct TV. I just follow NFL ticket wherever it goes. I go. <laughs> nice. so that's just what I do. MLB so, TV. Yeah, M so, MLB for me. So, um, so I, I, we, I understand the demand for, for better and high speed internet, but when government decides that instead of the free market and the free market providers stepping up their game or being competed against by another, uh, you know, free market company coming in because the demand's not being met when a city comes in, uh, and gets into this business of the internet and the internet, uh, broadband, um, they limit themselves and they actually put themselves in an uh, a difficult position where they're kind of the regulator of the free market where they give the easements for, mm -hmm. you know, the others to come through, but now they need a take up rate. They got to get customers. Cause if they don't, they got a bond that, you know, they got to pay 200,000 a month. If they, if they're not getting customers to pay it, they, your tax dollars go to it. So now when they look at a company that wants to come in and access the easements, dig into the street to improve service, to make it more attractive, if it works against that city's own system, so let's let's take a step back tough. and understand the system and how wh what exactly is it is it doing? Utopia kept coming up in my search. So yes. how is the taxpayer pay, paying the bill? If they don't get customers, how does the taxpayer end up footing the bill? I guess I don't understand that. Yeah. Branch. So so it's a good question. Um, and by the way, I because just could, to backtrack just a little bit because we're in podcast format. Um, this is one of the things I do, but. Like bright, like Braille, I, I was like watching a lot of Netflix when I was done with campaigns and everything. And mm -hmm. my business partner's like, you come around a lot. And the sheriff's association, sheriffs called me and said, you know, because I work with them a lot when I was a lawmaker. Yeah, of course. We got these public safety issues are a nightmare. Would you ever be interested in helping us with these bills that are coming? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, yeah. And uh, and so I, I have a public policy shop. It's small. It's me. Mm -hmm. But I, I do take on and it's I don't advertise. It's just if if I'm approached and asked to help on issues, I learned a little bit along the way. So I, I do, a, I do, I, I engage in public policy. Um, and then, but this is a, this is an education campaign. This really doesn't ha have a nexus with the state capital. This is more like in around the state of Utah, but let's get to this, to no government internet. Um, I did. I jumped right into it. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, no, no. I just wanted to, I appreciate I just wanted, you we going were, we were doing back. a chronological order there and we I were just wanted good. to kind of get, get there. Um, but uh, for this, Utopia started and and really didn't have a successful model at first. They were, bar they were having cities that were bonding, uh, and putting money up. They were not seeing the customer base come in. They were starting to lean homes that if you ever sold your home, they could the city could get its money back for Utopia. Um, and so this is called Utopia 2.0. And then there's another company called Strata that's doing this. What happens is this: Utopia, or a company, will come to a city council and they'll say, "Look." You're, you're you don't have great coverage you don't have great service here it's whether it's comcast or whoever the their, their providers, providers are um and this is typical in small towns though like in real small towns well, isn't isn't this because because like if you go out in a central right <laughs> it's like you get well yeah, thanks here's, Starlink. here's the irony going to solve the problem but you're not going to find utopia or strata in the small towns they only want to go where there's an economy of scale so they're going into the larger populated areas okay i'm so glad I, I would have just guessed. I would have just assumed. It's like this. Yeah. If if I'm going to say a public utility, the third world countries they have private, or, you know, free Wi-Fi for everybody, right? In like mm -hmm. these third world countries, because it's a it's almost a required utility right. for existence in civilization, right? And so, yeah. um, I could see how a government organization would say, "Hey, if if our people aren't getting it, we need to help them get it because the the money doesn't make <laughs> sense. It needs yep. to be a subsidy, right? That's what yep. it is." 
but you're saying they don't go to the people that <laughs> they need don't. it. Oh and that's, my gosh. And so, and that is the, the cruel irony of that, right? So they're going where there's already an economy of scale, where there's already a great market. There's mm-hmm. a pool of cust- willing customers. Uh, but admittedly, they might not be happy with uh, any, there's not been recent upgrades or they're not seeing the service the way they'd like it. So there's a demand, mm-hmm. okay? And the supply isn't where it ought to be. So what Utopia does and some this other strata, and there might be other companies, th- those are just the two that come to mind. And by the way, I'm not trying to, un- we're not trying to unwind anything. Anything that cities have done, they're, it is in. What it is. they're in. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing to say or do there. But for cities that have not decided whether to enter into this union of cities with Utopia or, or these other companies, these are, this is the information we want to share just so they have it and they have, they can ask the right questions. Uh, they come in a city council meeting and they say, look, you have this many uh, residents and mm-hmm. if they paid this amount, this much for their internet service, uh, we can, if you pay for it, so you bond and you, you city, you pay for the money to get the, get the fiber optics through every, yep. every street, every city. So the we'll, infrastructure, the infrastructure, we will do, we will, we'll plan it. We'll do it. We do it already. Um, you pay for it. You guarantee it, but you're going to make money back because you're going to have so many customers. They call it a take up rate. You're going to have so many customers because you're finally providing the high speed internet fiber that they were not getting before. You're going to have this great take up rate. So it, it ends up becoming a revenue to your city. It becomes more money. It's not even, it's not money out the door. It's money in the door. Mm -hmm. The challenge with that is there's some assumptions and the assumptions are that your take up rate is 40% or some number of homes. And and Utopia is going to still manage the software side of it, right? The, the the subscriberships and they, they manage the infrastructure itself and then they allow smaller ISPs, internet uh, service providers use that, that, conduit so they can provide so you have two bi- if you have a city that does this you have two bills you have your utopia or your bill for the infrastructure you'll pay once a month and then you'll have your isp that provides you the actual internet mm-hmm. but what i would compare that to um before we get to the risks that cities are faced when they get into that agreement um is if we had a service uh, a free market service and i was thinking on the drive down here what it's probably a bad comparison but let's say we had cater- companies that did catering for mm-hmm. weddings and everything else. Uh, clearly you can have the place where you make the food and everything else, but you got to deliver it to mm-hmm. wherever you're, whatever the, wherever the, the event. event is. So let's say you had some free market caterers that are doing this. You have some there that, that can make some great food, but they don't, they have the transportation problem. Yeah. They can't get the, the vans there. They don't have the way to do it. It would be like the government's paying for your transportation for the caterer to get to where you need yeah. and direct com direct competition with the caterers that, went and bought the vans and went and got the right. drivers and did all of that. And so I, I, I don't see that as a level playing field in the free market when you have the government paying your conduit. They, they should be. You yeah. 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 To, to do that. So, so that's the, that's kind of the free market. That's like a, the philosophical uh, issue that needs to be spoken about. Like fundamentally, this is outside of the way the government should be operating within the economy, the free market yes. economy that we have. Fundamentally, just from from step one, we're already off track. Yeah, by saying we really to this are. company that that they need to come in here and do that, especially if the bottom line is it's just going to make you more money, not your residents really need it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. Your residents really need well, it because because I think if it didn't make money, it still wouldn't matter because your residents really need it. Yeah. So when they do the bond, so you're saying every c- citizen in that city would have a tax and would no, be being so, taxed. So or this is so what it is is like it's black. A gener- ops. It's a general yes. It's it's a general obligation bond. So you don't see it on any Geo of the taxes. Bond. Yes. And and what it is is that your city has a general property tax that you pay to your city. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then they get a portion of sales tax. So they get cities get revenue. They go to the bond market and they say, let's say it's um, the example in Provo was they, they borrowed $40 million in a bond to create this iProvo and they got into this business. Um, Brilliant name. They totally nailed it. Isn't, it's isn't so that thoughtful. Great? Isn't that so crazy? Sorry. I'm not so, making Provo. Um, Don't be so mad they, Provo. They, um, so they got into this and then they needed what you call the takeover. They need customers to pay the bill to really like iProvo more so than any of the other internet providers. Uh, they were not seeing that take up rate. So what happened is their their bond obligation or their their payment, their monthly payment on the bond to pay it down every month that comes due, 
if you don't have the customers to pay, then it comes out of your general fund. Well, that general fund would have either been otherwise been used for your public safety, uh, your parks, your mm-hmm. the the lanes that cities are typically in. That they, they can only that's actually <laughs> they have, their only thing they, they can got control. A, they got lanes, right? And they're, yep. they're they're unique to cities. And if they have to take dollars away from those lanes to make the bond payment because they didn't get enough customers in the new internet business they jumped into. That is the detriment. Oof. So what Provo ended up doing after spending 40 million is Google fiber came in. They said, if you, we'll give it to you for a buck, they gave it to them for $1. And then they, and then the new fiber company comes in, they have to actually do upgrades to it and everything else. The other scary part is this, and you know, tech, you're, you're a tech, I would call so you. So hold on <laughs> let, let, real quick. So yes. I Provo failed and uh, Google fiber came in and bought I Provo for Their a entire dollar Entire system for a dollar for a dollar. And all the while, these this was continuing to cost provo money yeah as soon as they gave it to them for a buck they no longer had to pay any more money so they just get they just handed it all over to google fiber google fiber had a existing infrastructure but they had to do improvements on it but it, for i guess the new internet company did their math and said it's easier it's cheaper for us to buy this bad system or this system that's not very popular and upgrade it than it was to start one from scratch now i will tell you that in draper which is the other where i live the utopia came with this presentation. This was back in February, I think of like 21. And by the way, this really grew this whole government and cities doing internet grew around COVID. There was a lot of dollars running around. Mm -hmm. This is when, and I didn't know I wasn't tracking it, but this is where this really went. Not only just throughout the state, but Utopia is in uh, working on projects in Idaho now and in Arizona. And I think it's like when I searched, there's over 300 cities that are in, involved in some kind of yeah and i'm telling you it's government a, even if it's internet. a short term you've gotten you hit you now have a higher speed access today not even medium term and certainly not long term is this going to to play out well because technology always changes i mean you have innovations you have you have well i i can't help but think those those cities you know in the middle of nowhere uh elon musk solved it with starlink and it didn't it, it was a it was a, t- a matter of time not necessarily whether it was capable or not. Like this is where I think the government tries to solve problems in sometimes in a preemptive way that actually causes more problems down the road where if they would have just stayed out of it, the, right. the free market would fix these issues. So, so think about this. So um, the reason why you're not seeing these companies that are talking to cities, but I want to go back to Provo. So they went to Sorry. Provo. So Utopia went to Provo and said, look at how much you could make. We could get 40% or some percent of your households and businesses to sign up. We for, could lower, you could lower taxes. You can lo- exactly. Because you're going to get so much money in. And I listened to the, cause this was this, this predated my involvement in this issue, but, but I could hear the archived uh, yeah, yeah, hearing. Yeah, yeah. So I went back and listened to the questions and the questions were brilliant. They said, if it's, um, if it's such a moneymaker, if it's just going to, if it pencils from day one, why do you need us to bond? Why do we have to put our bond rate? Why do we have to have Great the risk? question. And, and the answer back was, well, the other cities have done that too. So you're just kind of doing what other cities did. And the council member's like, no, I think it's because there's a risk. That's why yeah. you need it. You need someone to bear that risk. Um, and, then, and you're banking that a government is the perfect person to bond on your risk because yes. they're never going to default. They're going to always pay <laughs> they're that money. They're going to pay their bills and it doesn't matter the, the, what uh, what goes unfunded to do it. But but then the next member of the council uh, asked the question, so we're buying into a technology today. Bonds are 20, 30 years. Uh, how, uh, how is that still cutting edge as we're still paying the bond decades from now? And Another answer, great question. Isn't that great? And I'm telling you, this is where we, if we if we don't have these conversations ahead of time, there are some well-meaning public servants who are just trying to do their level best with the information they get. Exactly. That if they hear that presentation the way it's presented, it doesn't sound like it's a hard decision. It sounds like it it makes sense to do. But you have to you have to these are the questions that need to be asked. How does this technology live and stay competitive over 30 years with innovations and change? The answer back was fiber is light and this is a 50 year fix. This is a 50 year technology. You don't have to worry again. Come on. You just mentioned Elon Musk. Bezos is looking at the same thing with the low orbiting uh, satellites. Mm -hmm. There is so much. We know this. I know I'm the technology uh, immigrant. You were born around technology. I, I lived in a world without any of it. Yeah. Um, But even I know 
that the the, the tech the technology speed all of this is changing so well, I, quickly. The funny thing is, I think you still have a better perspective than all these other people, right? That take it take yeah. it for granted, right? Yeah. But the question is really good, and then with the answer, my question is: with those questions, how did that city council decide to move forward with it? Well, Why Draper did didn't. So when Draper, oh that was Draper. Oh, so Draper I thought you were talking said, about Provo. So okay, Provo so Draper didn't ask those had those questions, great questions, and they they bought them out and gave got it away it. for a dollar to because get they just got sold. They had a great salesperson their neck. And I'll tell you, there's a great op-ed written by man. We need to hire the guy who ever sold sold Provo on that one. <laughs> that is a great salesman. Yeah. I'll tell you because uh, John Curtis was the mayor uh, in Provo, and he inherited this I Provo, and he was a member of Congress when he wrote an op-ed saying. This thing was killing our city. I mean, it was it was influencing every budget decision we were making as a city because of the costs oh that this thing had. Gosh. And say so he'd tell you today that this wasn't cities really don't need to get in, shouldn't get into the internet business. It's not their lane. It's not going to work. So, so how but many Draper asked those questions, Robert, and said no, thank you. And then guess what happened? A year late, a year and a half later, a new internet company came in, uh, or yeah, fiber and. They had to come up with an agreement because they weren't the old cable company or the phone company. They said, we're going to have to cut into the street. They came up with a, a an agreement to be able to get an easement and do it. But think if Draper had gotten into that business and you had a new company that wanted to come in, they they would be their competition. They wouldn't want to make that agreement. Exactly. They would, they would push it away. So to your point earlier, when the government tries to get in this lane and tries to do this, it's actually going to repel some of the risk capital that would otherwise come in or mm -hmm. the innovation that would come in. Mm -hmm. And so right now me living in Draper, I've got, and I've switched to the brand new uh, fiber company, but the taxpayer is not at risk for a single cent. Right. And there's a new company that came in and competed with the existing ones because there was a demand. So I, I, I just think that that's uh so I, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I yeah. see that it's a problem. I also Start. I'm starting to think. Okay, there's already 300 cities that are involved in these geo bonds. They can't unwind them. No. Even if you unwind them, yeah, I don't even know how you would go about doing it. Right. Let's say right. there was a city that just got into one, and then the realization hits them after the fact. And I mean, is there anything they could do? No. No. So, and I, so and do you think this has swept the nation, as they say? Do no, you think this whole it or is well, there still cities? Utopia is is the is the national. Uh, standard bearer for this idea. They are the ones that are saying, look in red Utah, look at what they're doing. Look how great this is. It is growing, but here's, here's where in Washington County, it hits you. This is, a, you have, you have a, you're the largest County that's not on the Wasatch front by way of population. Yeah. That is a unique relationship on a bunch of different levels, but you have a, a large, you have the largest population furthest away, frankly, from the state capital and from, and from the Wasatch front. Um, you have a city that's signed up and is doing it, Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. I will, I am, I'm just convinced that Utopia or Strata, whoever did that, they would love additional economies of scale by approaching your other cities, mm -hmm. St. George or, or Ivins or you name it any, and saying, look, it's, we, we're doing it here. It's working. Why not here? Maybe. Yes. Yeah. And even if it's on the short term working, you are, it has a chilling effect on the, on the free market coming in. There's, there are billions of dollars being spent on research and development to get better. Cities don't spend that the, on this. And so the, the hope is that as we have this discussion and we want to have this with the public, but we also want public servants to hear this in a non-aggressive and, and, and combative way, but just hear this information out before you make some decisions. I, I think it's important because I think if, if you just give them the lane to come in to any city council and give their presentation and there's no other side of the story ever discussed or understood, it, it, it does make sense to a lot of cities to go ahead and sign up for this. Mm -hmm. So can I go conspiracy theorist? Yes. <laughs> You're going to let me. Oh yeah. I like it. It's a podcast, right? Yeah. Isn't that what people yeah. do on podcasts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so correct me if I'm wrong. You have a government owned internet service. Yes. And so now there's a censorship acts aspect to that, that I think is almost not necessarily implied. Cause you're like, okay, well, do, do, would they actually control or could they get data from? Yes. They can do all those things. Right. Yeah. And so, okay. Your back, <laughs> the backside of the flyer, you should know. Look at some of the most ardent, uh, supporters of government. George, George Soros. <laughs> yes. Right out of the gate. Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. democratic socialists of America. And Senator Ed Marquis of Massachusetts. Yeah. I don't so, know him. And, and what it is, is it's, they want to ensure public control. Remember, public control of communications. 
uh, technology and expand infrastructure. And, and it's, it's just like on the software side. I mean, this is my worry. Cause I'll get, I'll get conspiratorial with you. The worry about, I don't mind electric cars. I really don't. If people want to have them, I, I think they're glorified uh, golf carts. You got to look at them that way. Like if you had a community and you could drive your golf cart around the community, it has its limitations. Okay. And I, I think that, that electric vehicles do, but I think there's a lot of great things that if, if you have choice of different, you know, propulsion methods, if you like electricity, you got to have it. The scary part of going all electricity is that now you're dependent on a public utility. Mm-hmm. and your supply of electricity for that vehicle not the free now, market of not the gas like station fuel. not the private sector the the you know the free market guy that wants to sell you the gasoline you now have a public utility that's going to decide how much when you see brownouts in california you see how they can control power so if you had if you had not just google or something like that or, or if we're worried about censorship on on social media platforms or search engines if you have government control and ownership of even the fiber itself and it's it's the conduits of communication i i don't know how that's philosophically a a, a best practice yeah i i don't think so too i think um but i also think the public utility there's challenges with that right that the individual municipalities being in charge of their power you know their singular singular power that's i think also another issue yeah it is because uh, I had uh, Lori Mangum. I think it's Lori. Maybe it's Laura. Lori Mangum. She was the director of uh, power for St. George City for almost 20 years. And I had her on the podcast and mm-hmm. we were talking about uh, different city utilities. And she was yeah. talking, saying that cities all across the country go bankrupt because of their power bill, because they don't adequately purchase power on the open market, if you will, right. because they're purchasing the power if they can't generate it themselves. They have to go to the market to purchase it. Yeah. And that cost... If, if you're buying it incorrectly, can go up very rapidly in bankrupt cities. And so yeah. we think of this is a frag, it's a fragile system all around, all interconnected together. And, it, you know, you know, you bring up a good point and that, and it's, and it's also the difference when, when you hear that, um, broadband networks or infrastructure and they try to compare it to water or, or, you know, natural gas or whatever it may be, or, or electricity. It's not because you, you don't have a choice of electric companies to choose from. You don't have right. a choice of water companies to choose from. Right. But there are inherent challenges when you have only a single utility. But that's – so the state has our public service commission, which mm-hmm. is supposed to really be care, like watching how – Helping those yes, cities and, and so there's a – if you're going to have a single source for your utilities, uh, our statutory structure in Utah is to have a very, very close eye on that for and on behalf of the consumer mm-hmm. to make sure that we're because we have no choices. We right. don't, we don't have any competition in the, in that space. So uh, the utilities inherently do have their challenges. We have a public service commission that's supposed to watch over that. But I got to tell you, even shutting down all these coal fired power plants, when you have, so Rocky mountain power, they is, can't do it. Uh, the, the bottom line is they can't do it. It, it would, it would be yeah, there's a no, massive there's nothing behind it. That's ready to there's take over. There's nothing else there. No, there's nothing else there. We can't, we can't shut it down. No, a, but you know what? Pacific core, which is owned by Warren Buffett uh-huh. and you know, and they, they own Rocky, Rocky mountain, mountain power, power, but they're in California and they're in Oregon and Washington. We and, send more power yeah. to California <laughs> than we use ourselves. I know. And they want to shut down our coal fired power plants here. I think the legislature is doing a great job in, st- Did you, in terms of staying in front of that and prohibiting it. But anyway, we have the cheapest power I think bill. I'm, I think I'm digressing. We again. have the cheapest power in the whole country yep. in, in Utah. We really do. And in, in Southern Utah, we rank probably in the top 25 in the country for most expensive electricity in Washington County. You do? Half the county is powered by Rocky Mountain Power. <laughs> and they have the most expensive bills, you but most that, of the state doesn't use Rocky Mountain Power because they're it's the for do, all the. Do you know that Rocky Mountain Power has areas. in front of this public service commission I mentioned a thirty percent rate increase for all of their users. I saw that. You see this? I saw it. You know what? Because I'm doing. on Rocky Mountain Power, I gotta pay them. Yeah, me too. So you know what? Part of that is what they're losing in their in their wind generation from Wyoming. They went to this alternative. Oh, it's not no. working. They're losing their shirt, and they are trying to make up that difference. In, in, when uh, they should have invested in nuclear, but they didn't. Okay, we're so okay. far off. I know, sorry. but So uh, I think it all ties together a little bit, right? Is when we go to government-owned, insert the thing, right? Yes. We, we're causing more challenges that even the elected officials can't manage, going back to the very beginning of the conversation. Yes. And it, it ultimately, the only person that pays the cost is the taxpayer. Correct. 
That's that's the person that's bearing the risk. Nobody else is. Yeah, right? and, and look, if I have a city right now, if you if you had Utopia Strata come and say, look, Hughes is crazy. I mean, we're seeing these cities, they're making great revenue from this and we have happy customers. That's great in 2023, 2024. At the end of the day, you are still the backstop on that loan. You are still the one who has to pay it if those customers ever leave. Now you have a city who can't afford to ever see those com- those customers leave. They're not putting money into research and development every year like free market companies do. And I just, I'm going to say on the medium and long range, even those that would be happy with their arrangement of municipal paid for broadband networks, you're living on borrowed time. Could I you, really believe you are. M- m- um, you said we can't unwind it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We, yeah, we're... We're only an hour and a half in. We're 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 okay. We're not See, I Joe said we Rogan yet. I could do a Joe Rogan one. I could do a Ro- Joe, Joe Rogan okay. one with you. I could do one I'm, with I'm you. Having, I'm having. I'm. Time's flying. I'm just okay. Just riffing here. So if the cities, if the cities own it, couldn't they just sell it like they sold it to Google, like Provo sold it to Google, while it's making yeah, well, a profit pay the and get out of it first? I mean, they got to pay their. They got to pay that bond off somehow. I think Provo had it long enough where they were paying off that forty million dollar bond because they would well, have had you to could charge that more in the than agreement. the dollar. Yeah, you could wrap that into the agreement with the, with I just the buyer, don't know the, the private new, owner. I don't know that the new uh, internet. If, if it wasn't a, a buck, I don't know that they'd want it. I think that's they'd probably rather, true because you know how great this was. So when this new company came into Draper, um, they did like this ditch witch. It was like a small cut into the street, and they just came in. They closed the street for a day, like a day. I was able to leave for work in the morning. I came back; it was already done. They just cut into the street, and they were able to asphalt over it. But they were able to to get the whole the whole city of Draper. They're in Sandy. Um, they're in pro I think they're Provo now, but anyway, Salt Lake city, but there are really efficient ways for them to do that. That are not cost prohibitive. Even the timeline of the Draper city council members and the mayor of Draper told me the timeline that utopia had given for how long it would take them to get the city. Fiber ready. Uh, was almost twice the amount of time that the private sector came in later and did it and, and got it ready for the people of this, of the city. So, it's a it's you a see, blatant bait and switch. <laughs> it's such a glaring bait and it switch. Is. It is, and I and I am and I'm embarrassed that I ne- this was going I, on, I, and I didn't you know I didn't want to bring it. up Santa Clara. You brought up Santa Clara, but come on, Santa Clara. I just think that you know I don't want to. I don't. We are. They already have shared utilities with Ivans. Like we already don't have a big <laughs> enough tax revenue base because they won't let businesses in. Santa Clara and Ivans won't let businesses in, and it's it's so insane to me base? because they don't. I don't understand how the residents don't understand what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. 20 years ago, they were begging. Yes. 20 years ago, they were begging. We're like, bring b- businesses in. Like, we're we're hurting. And yeah. then in such a short time, because we have so many people move here from out of the area, and the the collective voice of saying, we don't want change, and yeah. at, no, no matter what the cost, the idea of putting businesses in here changes traffic, and you get all the fear tactics, right? Just yeah. the classic fear tactics, yet- you're trading that for a world that is worse where you don't have a, the ambulance doesn't show up because you can't afford right. to pay for a paramedic to get there <laughs> and you're having a heart attack. Like you're, it's, you lose out true. on all these and, fundamentals and you're a gro- I mean, there's so much growth happening down here. And so managing that growth is inherently a challenge. And, 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 and so I, th- that's not an easy topic to take on, but you do need sources of revenue. And if you don't have, because cities see a lot of, see healthy revenue from sale, sales tax. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you have a Maverick, if you have a, if you have. Harmons, they, it brought yes. in, for Santa Clara, brought, bring, brought in a million dollars in tax revenue yes. a year. Great investment. And just understand that if you don't have the Harmons, then your property tax and that portion, when you see the list of the school district and the water sewer district and the county and the city portion, that city portion is going to have to go up. Yeah, uh, where the sales tax wasn't collected at, at a at a business, and so the only way you can lower your taxes is if somebody else is paying that tax. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's that's the it. only way. That's it. And you're a pretty popular place down here. There's a lot of people be willing to pay that, and they do our TRT funds, right? Yes. Which I think are restrictive. Honestly, I wish we could open those up a little bit more right. and, and right. broaden what it means to like. Because growth impacts growth, right? So that the the tax revenue getting from tourism goes towards Half of that money goes towards marketing for more tourism, which I understand, especially yeah. to jumpstart things and get yeah. things going. Uh, yeah, but do we need 50% of it to market to more people? And, or you know, do those and, people are just going to keep coming and, back? And the reason why you're, here. I think you're tracking that exactly right is that the, the TRT doesn't, con- doesn't contemplate the, um, 
the ripple effect of some of this. So you get a lot of traffic. So your criminal justice courts um, are are probably more full here because of the amount of people that come in and out of here. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, your roads. You might have so many, you know, roads have a population of people that live there. But if you have three times that population at given times, because so many people come, mm -hmm. there's wear and tear. Wear and tear. Um, there's just, and not Public safety. We have, we, we, we have, um, Vegas is down the street. And mm -hmm. so they prey on the tourists here. Yes. They get crews from Vegas. They come up here. So there's and it's not public to say, safety stuff. It's not to say that tourism is bad. That's not a, no, that's no, not it's a demonizing not. it. It's to say that, that the TRT ought to pay for things that are inherent. Because any other tax, if you had, if you had manufacturing here, you're not, uh, jurisdictions are not forced into how they would spend the, the taxes they would raise from a manufacturing plant or, or whatever economic uh, generation came and the mm -hmm. taxes they paid along with it. It's not so prescriptive on how that would be used. It would go into a general fund and then you would ad address it to priorities. Right. TRT gets very, very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And there's there's wisdom in some of that. And you uh, you said that. But I think it's missing a lot of uh, where that money could residual, go. Yes. Residual stuff so, that you can't allocate this towards that. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I do. So um, – Man, I got passionate about that when I got fired up. Oh, you should. You're in the you're in the heart of it. I mean, this is a a, a fast growing uh, county. It's your wa You got water challenges. Um, your water's good. You got good people on top of that. But but you do. It's not. You're in a desert. We can't. You know. We've had water. I, I've said this a bunch of times, but we've always had water issues. Yeah. From the day they settled this place. <laughs> and from both half of it, it was, we have too much water. It keeps blowing up the dams and flooding out everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do we stop the water? Yes. Yes. And then we progress to, well, we don't have enough water, right? And, and we've and been dealing with do, not enough but water. But you have to manage then. it. There has to be conservation. I love some of the ideas uh, that have come in how, how much lawn and what we do with lawns and what we do with, it just, just. This is a good point. Anyway, there's just smart ways. There's smart ways to tackle it, but. You're when you when you see as much a visitor, I call it visitor economy because it could be mm -hmm. whether it's going to Zions, but it could be, you know, I'm I'm bullish on a film industry. I love when films come in. They 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 take the the, the lumber yard and they build sets mm -hmm. and they're they're spending money there. They're blocking they, out hotels and and you know exactly. it's it's and it's not as cyclical with the economy because film industry is a little bit more steady. It's an industry. Mm -hmm. So I call it a visitor economy. I think that you are, a, you're one of the strongest visitor economy economies of counties that we have in Utah. So you should be given that, that tax base that's generated from that should address the issues that come up with it as well. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think what a lot of times happens is we get the, the TRT tax, correct me if I'm wrong, is getting influenced by the entirety of the state because this is a statewide uh, kind of initiative mm -hmm. from what I understand, but we're not park city. No. And, and actually we're not growing to be park city. Park city wishes they could be us, to be honest, if, if you really take a step back, because, yeah. you know, we do have a far more complex economy that we're, if vacation stuff stops, we're going to still continue to be okay because our, our economy is diversified. Yeah. Park city's not really diversified in any way. They're not. And so, but, but they, they have the Metro, they have, you know, the residual yes, population around proximity. them. They can, yes. They so can the help population them. population that's around them. Exactly. Um, they've got 75, almost 8% of, of Utah's whole population near Summit County, like within, mm -hmm. I mean, just very close. You, you really are on an Island down here. The better comparison for me is how Grant, Moab and Grand County is that, that used to have mining. They used to have a more diversified economy. Mm -hmm. They went, they, they got rid of mining. Which, by the way, they can mine rare minerals down there. If you like your electric cars, if you like your Teslas, uh, Moab, you ought to really be bullish on. And there's uranium, over uranium, there too. or yeah, and and all the lithium and all the things you could mine. They have in Grand County. They don't like extraction though, but they love the batteries that power the cars. But that is a tour. That is so. Yeah, they heavily... want to ship that to Africa. They want. <laughs> yeah, they want no. the Congo to, to kick to the get poor all their... gorillas out of their habitat and get all the lithium and cobalt from so there. They can drive their Subarus. Yeah. So. But, but the thing I'm is, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a, a Subaru. It's I'm a sorry. Tur I don't. <laughs> Man, I, do I look like a Subaru I know somebody to listening to this right okay. now that drives a Subaru. Okay, I'm, not I'm not talking judgy. about you. I shouldn't be so judgy I had about conserved Subarus. Southwest Utah on it. So I, I get the, the environmentalist perspective. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want mining either. I, but, I wish we didn't need any of that deal. stuff. But everything needs mining. I mean, like I said, even the batteries for your electric car need mining. You gotta, Our phones, all that everything. stuff. Everything. So, but um, there are tourism economy but they don't even like that anymore they're trying to shut that down mm -hmm. uh it doesn't leave a whole lot left That's right. uh and and the tourism economy can be a component of your portfolio but if it's all you have those those jobs those wages 
um, are not as competitive or not as, uh, uh, I think, healthy as extraction or manufacturing or other industries that, that frankly, uh, Robert, here's the deal. 80%, almost 80% of Utah's population lives in four counties in this whole state. We got 29 counties. Mm-hmm. The Wasatch Front is a valley. It can't keep growing, okay? Mm-hmm. When we have so much federal land that's owned, how the rest of the counties are able to grow and find economies, it's such a challenge. And so then what happens is, and I learned this probably, the I, I came to appreciate it, I should say, the most when I ran for governor. Mm-hmm. We have this growth issue here. You have growth issues here in Washington County. So many counties are seeing their county shrink and mm-hmm. their kids growing up and leaving their towns and not being able to raise their families where they grew up because there isn't an economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and we had five here, five years from 2008 until 2012, right? Four yeah. years that this County went through that same moment and we had yeah. amnesia or something happened. <laughs> yeah. It's so like we forgot that time frame. We have frame. got to see, we've got to see enterprise and growth and industry in these, com- all of Utah. If mm-hmm. we're going to grow responsibly, I keep seeing these numbers of where Utah is supposed to grow. Not on, not in its current footprint. It no can't, it, it, it won't work. We'll end up every, I've got kids in their twenties. We're, we're going to export these young ones. Yeah. Our younger uh, emerging workforce, emerging workforce is a infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, when I was the speaker of the house, I was talking to Robin Voss. He was the um, uh, speaker of the house in Wisconsin. I think he still is. He, he said that I'm a, he's a Republican conservative. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm a supply side or I'm a free market guy. I could bring in every manufacturing company that would want to come here. I don't have the workforce to fill it because I'm an aging state. My, the age of people from uh, Wisconsin is getting older. Healthcare costs are getting up there, mm-hmm. but they don't have young people to, to, to attract the industry to come in there. We have, we are, we are one of the youngest states in terms of how young our, our, our population is. We have an emerging workforce, but we're not, the cost of living is going up, quality of life's going down, and we're not seeing the industries where our kids can stay here and afford to live here. They're going to, we're going to export them out. We're going to raise them. We're going to educate them. And then we're, they're going to go to other parts of this country. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I'm a dad. I don't want that. I don't want that for my, my kids. My boys want to go to Utah tech. They're like, I want to go to Utah tech, which is great. I want them to go to Utah tech, but I want them to have a job when they're out of Utah tech and stay here. Or right. If, if we're here, I want them to stay here. I I want that ability to continue to raise, you know, um, having, having real ownership in the community means like spending significant amount of time there and getting to know the community. And you know what? Rural Utah is losing it. They are losing their young people. Yeah. So you, I saw these old lumber mills that are gone. They're rusted out. They were multi-generational families. And back in the 90s, Clinton just thought it was the environmentalists uh, in the Clinton administration, both together, didn't like the thinning out of the of the forests on the BLM land. And they mm-hmm. were thinning that out so that wildfires don't destroy millions upon millions of land if you have a lightning strike or something. So they were thinning it out. It was conservation. It was done in a smart way. It creates wood, wood for lumber yards. And lumber yards were selling their wood. You had generational fam- generations of families that were doing this. One day you wake up and they think that's a detriment to the environment. No more uh, going in and thinning the, the, the you know, the, the trees and everything out, those lumber yards are gone. They're dead. There's nothing there. The, the families move away They're I see them. They're, they're just rusted out and gone. That was it. That was an economy in Utah yeah. and uh, an important one. And it did other important things as well. Completely. Uh, yeah, we were completely victimized by it. So I, I don't know how the state is going to stay as strong and be a leader as it is around the country in terms of, I think, I always say it's the Utah's the worst except for all the rest. Okay. <laughs> Cause like it, it's, we do have some pretty good things going for us. A young workforce. That is, mm-hmm. that is something a lot of States don't have and would wish they had. Yeah. Um, we have a ton of natural resources. We do. We have our we economy. Have a so beautiful landscape. Yes. We have, we have a pretty amazing history, truthfully. Right. Mm-hmm. If you're LDS specifically, yeah. you can see, a, 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 you know, the, the writings and the history, the pioneership that, you know, built, this state, the ruggedness that was Mm -hmm. required to get to where we are. Like all that stuff's to be good. You know, you could be proud of all that stuff. Yeah. And and, and And look, so that quality, and that all amounts to a good quality of life, right? I mean, like where I grew up in Pittsburgh, I didn't know you could wear sunglasses. This sounds great. Sounds anecdotal or silly, but you don't wear sunglasses in the wintertime. The the clouds come in around November 
and you never see really the sun except a random day here or there till you hit spring again. Okay. Yeah. I, I moved to Utah and it's the snow's bright. You need sunglasses. You're wearing because the sun's shining every single day. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. It's nice to beautiful. see the sun. It's a, the state is absolutely beautiful. The quality of life is incredible. Um, but we're not, if, if people just think it'll always stay that way, it won't. If we aren't, if we don't understand or take inventory about why it is such a great so state. So foc- focusing on, okay, from now you're, you're outside looking in, you have no, nothing to, you can speak your mind. Not the, I, I, I know you speak your mind probably all the time, but politicians do this thing where they, they, when like, I was don't a public touch. servant, I was, I was a little more judicious, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. Cause, uh, I'll, I'll hand it to Brad Wilson. Yeah. He's probably one of the most polished politicians I've ever talked to, which mm-hmm. I have, it's not a big, it's not a big group, but I've talked to a lot of them. Yes. I, I talked to all the yep. s- people running for Senate and, and Congress and all those things. And he's so polished, but mm-hmm. it's difficult to like communicate. It's yeah. difficult to connect because yep. they're, they're trying to put these you, barriers. Do up. you realize that's what, what that's the Trump, that's the Trump uh, appeal to Trump. People, I, I think so many people in the political class that I know do not understand Donald Trump and they do not understand why he is as popular as he is, how he gets people that typically don't like politics or politicians. If you don't know vote. Dave Smith, oh, he nails it. He's on Tucker Carlson and he nails Does this he? exact point. So keep going. But you're, I think you're right. It's, it's he, his rough edges speak to people saying he's not, he, there's no focus group on what color tie. There's no, he's not polished. He's really just laying it out. Yeah. And yeah, you know, some of it is. It is rough around the edges, but it, it speaks to someone who's being more genuine than what they've been seeing in politics before. My friends in politics, uh, they, it, is, it completely escapes. They don't understand it. I do. I get it. I, I endorsed Trump in 16, and I was kind of by myself a little bit uh, in the political world when I did it. I was speaker at the time. I voted for Johnson, Gary Johnson. Yeah. I voted yeah. for Libertarian because yeah. I'm like, man, I can't have that guy be my president. Yes. I don't want to listen to him for four years. <laughs> I was but so, he's a real deal. The guy's telling me how it is, isn't it? I, I, you know, and then the, but then he is also still playing a game. He's still p- playing uh, – he's playing poker, right? I think uh, – um, Politics been described as like 3D chess. Yeah. Right. But the board's moving all the time. I think it's more like poker. You're playing different hands. Everybody has the same deck. I like that. But they're playing they're playing this strategy over this strategy. And and Trump played the this is what Dave Smith says. So I can't take credit for this idea, but he played the cards that he felt like nobody else wanted to play, but that resonated with the biggest amount of people, right? He picked illegal immigration and he was anti war. Yes. And of course, nobody wants pe- their kids to die in a war. And yeah. of course, open board, very, very few humans on the planet think an open border is a good idea. And so we everybody- say that now, uh, Robert, but think about this after after Romney lost in 12, they did the, uh, the Republican National Committee did this big study and they had concluded that the reason that re- Mitt Romney lost in 12 and why Republicans were not going to see su- electoral success going forward is that our 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 secure border position was being uh, framed as racism. And now we were going to lose elections over arguing for a secure border. And what Trump did is he turned that, that what was becoming uh, conventional wisdom on its ear and said what people at that time were starting to become afraid of saying. And it's like, no, you got to have laws. You got to have a rule of law. I don't believe that Mitt Romney rule. lost because of the I don't immigration either. policy. I'm I don't not either. sure you can connect those two things. I, I don't, he was running I'm against Barack Obama. Come on, I'm dude. not saying it's true. I'm saying this is kind that's, of the mindset this, I, that, that is a mindset to spread. That's, that makes mind sense. Mind virus, I call it. That you know, might, it's just, just started, one of many. Yes. But so, it, you know, so he picked those two things so it resonates. But let, let's yeah, go back to sorry. like the cards, right? Going back to the cards that are being dealt. I think I think we're focusing on the wrong cards in Utah. In some ways, um, however, affordable housing. Okay, so you've you've gotten into some development. You're, yeah. you're, you're not necessarily a real estate developer. If no, I was to analyze, like 100, 180 doors is yeah. a pretty small thing. You Thank know? You. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not you, but it's a great living. It's a great. Life. I like, actually appreciate the observation because everybody, if you just say development, they think that you're just this massive thing and it's, a huge construction. Yeah, right. So I'm like, not, you, we that. think it's like this guy who is disconnected. Mm-hmm. But you're also, in my mind, a career politician. Been to, I did it for, yeah, I did it for uh, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, you've done it for your adult life, right? Mm-hmm. And so understanding these different facets, that's where, you know, part of the bureaucratic system comes into play is that 
you put term limits. I think the argument for term limits, this is so a total sidetrack. Let's get back to uh, housing. Okay. Cause that's okay, what housing. I'm talking about. Uh, I'm part of the Housing Action Coalition here okay. in St. George. I don't mm-hmm. know if you're familiar with it's a small coalition. It's just here in St. Okay. George. Uh, we started in 2017 and we talked around the issue literally since 2017. Like yeah. we have not been able to like solidify a solution based strategy of saying, mm-hmm. how do we tackle this affordable housing issue? Because this with the current interest rates up, the problem still existed when interest rates were zero. Right. When they were two and three yeah, percent, the problem was still there. High, and then, yeah. yeah. So so. Home values were always appreciating. I think in Washington County, we've appreciated on average over the last 20 years, over 10%. Wow. On average, yearly, yearly. So this has always been a problem here. Mm-hmm. It's now becoming a problem across the, street, across the state. Yeah. Um, what do you think, in your mind, where does that issue lie on the spectrum of things that we should be focusing on? Because when I think of managing growth, I think of the first step is managing your residential housing yeah. situation. Cause when you have a base, then you have a labor economy and then you can work on commercial stuff. Yeah. Is that the right way of thinking I, about it? It is. So I have, there's, there, there's your immediate problem you want to tackle right now, which mm-hmm. it's, which is not going away. And, and the worst thing that can happen. And I've seen this in other communities where uh, your, your workforce housing, your teachers, your law enforcement, they, they can't afford to live there. Which, that, they which cannot afford cannot, to live here. You cannot for continue sure. to have a community that's thriving. If you're, you don't have teachers and you don't have law enforcement. You don't have paramedics. You don't have uh, And the solution nurses. isn't raise ta- taxes. And That's not, not what the solution is. So there's an immediate problem. Before I give you my, my best eye on the immediate problem, let me tell you long range what needs to happen, I think. Um, the finite of space and the, and the hyper focus in Washington County or the Wasatch Front, um, it's because we're not seeing that opportunity around the rest of the state. Now, what Utah has that's unique to any other state in the Western United States is that when the Intercontinental Railroad came through Ogden, came through here, Golden Spike there, every single coastal port from Washington State, California, you know, Los Angeles, Long Beach port, all connect and come through Utah through rail uniquely. That's not the case in Idaho. That's not the case in in, uh, New Mexico, anywhere. This state has more rail infrastructure that gets somewhere than any other state in the West. The golden spike. It is. It's and it's and that's why we have it. But we've never really taken advantage of that infrastructure. So we have a rail I've infrastructure never about that. That's that brilliant. is superior to everyone. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you know what? We're we're not seeing it. We're not seeing and by the way Is it I, still the cheapest way to, to transport absolutely. goods by long shot, right? Yeah. Well it is if you have a lot of it doing it, if you, if you have fewer people doing it, then you can Pacific, enough, everyone's trying enough. to just stroke the ones that, that use them. But if Good you point. have, if you had more demand, you had people that were, if you were using it. Yes. And, and by the way, it takes so many trucks off the road. When you talk about those, mm-hmm. those trains, um, it, it helps on the quality of life side. It helps on the transportation side on all these other issues, but we have so much rail, we have spurs. Let's say that you had a, you had a loop that was for something and that business has gone out of business. There are so many things we could use it for. To put it in something yes, new. In. Yes. And I'm telling you that I am so bullish on exports. Like I, I'm done with China giving us, you know, cheaper socks at, at Walmart. I don't care. We need jobs in this country. We need jobs in Utah. We should be an exporting state. We have, we can export, we can send things out. Um, and we have the rail to do it. So when we talk, is this a little bit? And we have land to put people to go sit. My in, like, goodness, do we I ever. can't think. Okay, so <laughs> if, you, if you take a step back on the illegal immigration, you say, okay, if, if, we, if our kids are getting educated and in, in doing blue-collar jobs, who's, doing, who's the labor force that's working, you know, the service industry jobs, right? The, mm-hmm. the low-wage worker, mm-hmm. where are they? There, there is an immigration population into the United States that can fit, fit that position, and they're willing to do anything. Yeah, they will do and figure out whatever they need to do to do we it. We just have to get the cartels to quit escorting them across here because exactly. they got designs on them. They right. got them doing right. Their so stuff. There, there's the there's the unhealthy version of immigration, yes. and then there's the healthy version of immigration, Correct. which built the country. By the way, let's not forget that part. Potato famine. That's when the Hughes came over so, from Ireland. So when we think about <laughs> like how do we utilize the state as a exporter of resources, I think this is brilliant. I always so, I always thought it was funny. Why didn't we get a railroad down in St. George? And then I was like, oh yeah, it goes up and down and around and canyons and all this other stuff it's like almost a, a engineering marvel to get it down here but look how close uh I, look how close iron county is to you and that that you have a line that comes 
Yeah, so close. From from Long Beach, Los Angeles, Long Beach comes right. I mean, the government built the spur off of that main line into Iron County because of the iron. Yeah. Uh, during World War II. Surprise, surprise. So you, uh, there is not, you don't have to go far to have um, incredible connectivity. Mm-hmm. We've just never, we do not take advantage of it. If we wanted affordable housing, well, why don't we go where the cost of living is lower, mm-hmm. quality of life is higher, and we start seeing that. And, and, and honestly, prop, one of the problems is that you have a legislature that they represent populations, right? So most of those lawmakers represent the most populated areas of the state. And so your perspective of your more rural areas, they're losing it. So every census we're getting fewer, the the number of state reps and and state senators representing rural Utah gets smaller because those communities are shrinking. And why are they shrinking? There are no jobs. It's a vicious, you know, it just keeps going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. If we're going to grow and we want affordable housing and we want high quality of life, I am telling you the state has got to start looking at this transportation infrastructure advantage that we have that no other state has. And, and that is kind of the lar- that's kind of the longer range plan. Um, what could the I private, would, that I would but what say. could the private industry do, right? Instead of passing it off, said that the state is in the government well, or like, when I say state, I don't want them to create industry. What I, what everything needs infrastructure. So we have the rail, but if we needed to improve the rail, uh, to make it attractive to a manufacturing to come in, mm-hmm. uh, if you need, you know, the water and the, there's just a lot of things like we talked about earlier that, that government does uniquely. Mm-hmm. That it only can do with, with utilities and roads and stuff like that. Get that, get commit and invest in these areas with that kind of superior infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And that is where businesses, I believe, would be drawn to and mm-hmm. that they would grow. I mean, you're seeing you're seeing the sprawl along the Wasatch Front from Utah County and, and coming south, you know, and 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 I just think that instead of it being so hyper focused in that four county area and then coming down here to, to Washington County. You could see a lot more opportunity that would spring up uh, if, and I, and again, government's only role in that would not be to subsidize any of it other than to bring in the infrastructure needed where it makes sense, business sense for jobs. So, so then it's like business coalitions, right? Like if you were to say, okay, the, the St. George area chamber of commerce, right? So I'm part yes. of the chamber of commerce. We're doing a rise summit. So we're doing an annual summit of business leadership. We talk about all kinds of things. Uh, I'm doing one specifically on housing. So one of the issues we have is is labor workforce that can afford to live here, right? right. And so affordable housing, going back to that, is kind of the, the central thing. You know, understanding our transportation um, infrastructure that we already had yes. and utilizing that. You know, increasing jobs is is a way, right? Increasing the wages can impact affordability. So if you bring in high wage jobs, then now the house that's insanely priced is still okay because you make enough money in your job yeah, right yep, yep. so so what do you think about the the specific housing industry have you looked at zoning or what what the challenges are why are we building in st george this is what yeah. we build ten thousand square foot mansions that are seven million dollars yeah or um basically townhomes they're connected townhomes they're basically you know just this uh really weird version of uh 1920s downtowns right like just all these like vertical buildings that are narrow and they all look identical and they're in these big slabs all over the place those are the only two things we build i don't understand so you know i've been to planning commissions i've i've seen you know it it is even in america with all our freedom we do have people that draw pretty pictures on our land you know and Mm -hmm. tell you what you can build or what you can't and and then along the wasatch front they're sensitive to the housing issue and so they they make these decisions of Okay, you have to provide a certain number of housing stock that's within 50, 60% of the area median income. Okay. And so then they, there's some number. And look, developers are trying to get something built. So they're trying to agree to something. These, these, what I call percentages of AMI and, and numbers in the macro like that, I, I, I'm a little bit cynical. I don't, I don't think they work very well. But I do think that they're in the short term, if you were looking at a development and you were looking at someone who's coming to the city for permission for land use change, zoning changes, if you were to um, incentivize or say, particularly for workforce housing and say, look, we need, we need, uh, you, we know what the median income is for, for your nurses, your teachers, whatever it might be. We need within your development, you need to have a certain amount that's 
that meets Fits this. Fits that criteria. But I would be more surgical about it right now because they're already being surgical when they're zoning. I, I mean, if it's already out there, I don't want to land in someone's neighborhood and tell them what they what that neighborhood has to already look like. But if someone's if, if development developers are coming to counties or cities and saying, we want you to rezone this and we want to create this and we only want to create $7 million mansions or townhomes. I do think it's within the lane of that city and that playing say We actually want to see a, a, a broader uh, inventory. Yeah. And I would, uh, but I would be very, very sensitive to the most critical workforce in your County that you can't really be a County without. Mm -hmm. And that those are the ones. So I wouldn't just say across the board, anyone who makes, 60% of area median income. I would look at the people that work in particularly critically critical industries or, or professions and then what median incomes there that they can afford. And I'd say in your, and you don't want to cluster it all in one spot, but in your development, you need to have some representation of, of this type of housing stock that, that they can, that people, critical employers can afford. I, I think if we do that, what, to me, that's only one. It's only like it's, one it's tiny domino yeah, because because if we think it it's because what we end up getting, what we end up getting is if the cities force the developers to to put that slice in, mm -hmm. but then they restrict the density number and say you can only fit this many dwellings per square acre, which most of the ordinances ordinances have. Yes, right. And every city has a different one. Mm -hmm. None of them match, right. and most of them are ridiculous. Truthfully. You end up, um, the developer goes to the pro forma and they're like, yeah, that's not going to pencil. We're not going to do that. All right. We'll talk to you in 10 years. And then they leave the land vacant until they can do something else. Yeah, no, that you're right. I, so that's, that's a, that's a surgical. That's a, that's the first thing I would do. So see how but, that's just, to me, it was like, it's, this is one of them. I, I, but, I agree. Let me tell you where I think it would lead to. So uh, I don't know if this is the, the the best uh, comparison. But when I was with my business partner, we were building these small apartment units mm -hmm. and we had purchased and fixed up an old apartment building uh, that was almost a hundred years old uh, in downtown Salt Lake. And they had, they had uh, studio apartments. Mm -hmm. And while studio apartments didn't get a, as much per month for rent, if you looked at their per square footage, it was a good return, these studio apartments. But new construction back in the early 2000s, there was, you couldn't find any multifamily um, apartments that were doing the housing stock of studios. And I remember the commercial appraiser that we were talking to who was super smart. Every bank wants to see this guy's appraisal because he's very, very good at what he does. And he, was, he leveled with us and said, You're, it's an it's a antiquated uh, housing uh, stock. Nobody wants a studio. They want a roommate. They want, it just doesn't work. We were convinced we were, we were too stubborn in our late twenties to listen to that. We You're were like, too no stubborn. way we're doing, we're doing studios. Cause we think studios work because we, they pencil in this old building we have. Mm -hmm. Well, we did them and they did work. And once, and I'm not saying we started this trend. I don't believe in but, any appraisers anyway, by, by the way, I, I, I don't know if there's a good one out there. It's your day there's a job, couple I know. good ones. I know. There's a couple of ones that I know personally. I'm like, this is not directed to you. If you After know me podcast, and we talk all the time, this is I'll not directed to you. It's you about the all the other ones I've never met before. So, um, I, fair enough. Um, but I'm not saying we started this, but you see studios now. And in, in new housing stock and it's not hard and it, and it does work. Okay. Yeah. But there had been this mindset that it wouldn't. I think if you started to direct uh, availability to your critical workforce at first, it will pencil, it will have demand, it will show that it works. And I think it will lead to, to more of that housing stock that comes online. Well, so, so the five over one. So like we have a couple of these in the works here in Southern Utah. So yeah. I think what I'm hearing you say is, is a, a really high dense, that this would be tr a truly high dense option. Or even the single, maybe dense, the, but so, single uh, family homes. So you have homes, but you don't have the, the giant setbacks. You don't have big yards. You mm -hmm. can do, you can do, cause look, so, the so dirt costs okay. so much and you're going to divide it per home. Right. Uh -huh. So if I have 11 acres and I can put, if I put one house on 11 acres and that my house starts at the, however many millions it cost me for 11 acres, you put two, you split it in half on and on. Right. If you could put single family homes that are smaller, so the density is higher, but there's, they're not attached wall, but they're smaller. The price point, especially entering it, it would be, it would, it, there'll be a demand for it. It'll work. It yeah. will pencil. Yeah. It will. It's just that I don't know how much, how fam much familiarity there is with that kind of, I, and I'll so tell you some this. of the cities like so um 
I had Jeremy Johnson on. You might be familiar with yeah. Jeremy Johnson. iWorks, but he's also uh, working with Box House, and he's building prefabricated ADUs. Okay. So he's importing boxes from China. He's doing finished work. He's got cabinets from you know all uh, different kind of places, but he puts them all together here in the States, and then he's basically doing workforce housing in Texas right now okay. with these ADUs. Okay. They're, um, they have their own chassis, so they're... Technically, a manufactured home because they can stand alone. They don't need a foundation. Um, but there's a lot of cities that th- I could not put that thing on there. They might have a rule that says you can put an ADU, but the rules around that ADU are so restrictive that right. you you can't you can't subdivide it down enough, you know, for infill stuff. But even r- vacant land within a city, right? Mm-hmm. The rules make it almost impossible to build that small. Like in Ivan's, you can't build smaller than a thousand square feet. A dwelling cannot be yeah. smaller than a thousand square feet. Do you find this? Do you so find, I think that's just like these all these little you, rules. Let me ask you this question because I've seen this uh, phenomenon as well. You um, you come you come to the city with a land entitlement. You want to zone. You want to rezone something. You know, if you could have a timely process with the costs of things, where interest rates are at the time, you might be able to deliver that home. At, at a certain price, but they, but people don't want change. They don't like, they don't want traffic. And you see, there's this negotiation of density, things like that. By the end of the process, if it took you 18 months to get through it, the homes that you're now able to market, if you are, are so much higher just by the time spent, the, the, you know, the, the larger, the lots, the, the fewer, mm-hmm. the homes there's, there is that interaction between those that are trying to develop and provide you know, homes and housing with the cities that have to be comfortable with what they're being, what's being proposed. And even that interaction, I think adds to the cost mm-hmm. of, of a housing. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, if it's, if you can't put as many on, you're going to have to get more from that home, mm-hmm. uh, because you're dividing it out over the parcel of land that you have. So I, and it also, it also, sh- it's, it's weird cause it shifts around housing too, because the developers like, I want to do this development. I'm restricted. It doesn't pencil because of whatever restrictions are. So I, I think the bottom line, I think a biggest, the biggest challenge is there's so much regulation in residential house, housing, mm-hmm. like so in such a minute way, like even down to the HOAs, yeah, I right? Know. I like know. there's so much restriction that to me is infringing upon my liberty, right? Like it's it, in my mind, the local governments have uh, gotten such a hold on that residential zoning and what's allowed and what's not that it's choking out the economy from yeah. it. You have design review committees that are members of the public that the city's asked if you if you're an architect, just me- at, 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 just random members of the of their city become part of a design review committee and they get to tell you how much brick how much stucco what what i mean they just they get to actually design in some jurisdictions and they're always a really smart architect one of yeah. the most renowned architects in the world yes right and, and they're all that way met, right? yeah you've been there i've yeah. met i've met a, i've met I've met more renowned architects I than I ever thought was possible. The worst thing for me when I was building my buildings, architects, is that when I go to the city and they'd redline stuff, these architects would take it like a shot in the heart. Like, how dare they redline my my design? My this, my, my this is my plan. I, I, I read be. all. I read all the code. I know exactly what's allowed. And I'm in like, there. hey, I'm trying to get something passed here. Can I, we you have, cannot come fight with them. Okay, yeah. I'm trying to get something done. <laughs> You know, this is, I mean, this is not your ego we're talking about. We're talking, just make it work. Fine. Okay. He's wrong. You're right. We still need it. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm just, I don't have, I don't, I'd love to have an answer and a solution yeah. and a silver bullet. I don't, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud with you about yeah, yeah. Uh, the challenges we have. All I do know is we cannot kick these young people out of our state. And if we don't have a place for people to live, that's mm-hmm. what we effectively are doing. So mm-hmm. I, I hear you. I, what has your your group's been 30,000 feet up in the air. You haven't really come down to the ground, but have they come up with any ideas to proffer to I mean, I, affordable housing? I, I think uh, a few of us, it's it's funny because the problem, it, it feels like people go to it, they agree there's a problem and they're like, yeah. yep, somebody else is going to figure it out. And then they walk out of the room and you're like, wait, I thought you were going to help us with this, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's this small group that grows and shrinks. Uh, right. And so- I, I'm I'm struggling to get all of the different organizations on the same page because yeah. we have a bunch of people working on this, spending copious amounts of hours. Yep, but we're not moving the ball forward. Well, and I'll tell you what. Here's so so it, 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 to me, it's like we have to get the singular message at the Housing Action Coalition Forum on October 30th down here. Um, it's at Black Desert. It's going to be awesome. It'll be one cool. of the first conventions there at Black Desert. Nice. 
So it's going to be a really great event. Uh, we're going to talk about this. I'm, I'm hosting a panel. I'm going to talk to two developers and Mayor Hart and Mayor Rosenberg. So that's October 30th. And I'm going to talk about um, this in one facet, but throughout the day and throughout the morning, we're going to try to hit all of the big facets with housing of like, hey, these are the things we all need to work on. And then we got to take this together and then we got to, we actually got to go work on it. And I'll tell you, you know? why. I think you're on the clock and I'll tell you why. Oh yeah. Uh, Kamala Harris. I'm not, I, I, I don't know what this country looks like if she were to win. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not saying she's going to win. But her housing proposal yesterday is about as scary as you get, in my mind, okay? She wants- um, She got it from the Soviets, I heard. Exactly. Well, she has the, the food price fixing she wants to do for our grocery stores. That's one thing. Um, uh, she wants- uh, well, how, much, how much? The funny thing is 60? we're preaching to the choir. Everybody's like, I know, it would be awful. I, $60 billion for government, for government to build- housing units okay that's in her plan yesterday that she unveiled the government you remember the chicago tenements that we all tore that were all torn down because government was really bad at building housing they didn't care and they were you know it just didn't work so we entered the private sector in and and you saw positive change she wants to go back to the governments governments across the country building housing units that's part of her plan she wants to give every single first time homeowner a a a uh, twenty five thousand dollars for a down payment. So five, you're in real estate. Five people have twenty five thousand dollars for that home. Who gets the house? The one that comes in with thirty. The one that comes in with uh, the more more. You know what actually happens is what? that I use that guy who needs twenty five or has twenty five thousand, and then I make the other guy who has cash pay more for it yeah. in a multiple <laughs> offer. And yeah. my seller makes more. The guy with cash was like, "Yeah, it was worth it." And then that person doesn't, doesn't get, get the get house. It. There you go. <laughs> See. So, so I just use them to yes. make the price go up on the free market with the cash that's in the market. There you go. So you're using the the subsidized credit to drive it, inflation. It goes up. It'll rise. It's it'll not increase the work, price house. So she's got twenty five thousand for that. She's got billions. She wants to govern that. She wants governments to build housing units, which is all high, high density apartments. Okay. Yeah. Um, she wants rent control. Now. I don't know how that we're great in California. Oh, oh my God. Isn't it amazing that, that the, the people that benefit the most from rent control are wealthy people because they aren't as transient. They don't move. So they don't see their rents ever go up. People that have, that are, that have us, you know, we're, the workforce, you know, working poor, they have to move every time someone moves. That's the only time a, a property owner has a chance to raise their rent to market. Mm -hmm. So anytime someone moves under a, under a, a stat, a, a city ordinance of rent control. Um, they, they reflect that increase on the vacancies because mm -hmm. it's the only place they can do it. If you move with any amount of frequency, you are always getting hit with the highest rents, which are the very people they're saying that they're trying to help. The exact it same, doesn't work. It's the exact same analogy that we did. And not only that, but the landlord no longer is going to fix anything. And so ultimately no. you go 30 years where that, that you started here, oh, you built affordable housing. 30 years later, it's dilapidated. Nobody even wants to move into nope. it. And and you get va uh, and, vagrants and that end up living in it because the landlord doesn't care. So this plan she and uh, Kamala Harris unveiled yesterday for, you know, for to help people. Um, on the housing side, it is so draconian. It is so left. It is it is all the, the proven, not theoretical the proven mistakes but let's be let's be honest though there's no we don't chance want that. that would ever happen she's saying this thing and pandering yeah, to a, a group well, of individuals well, she'll that throw says they money want, at it but who will she actually doesn't do actually it. believe that but yeah nobody's gonna yeah. yeah and even if she does it a small capacity it's still wasted income so the i i think you know we're running out of time the other thing reason we're running out of time is because berkshire hathaway just sold half half of apple uh you're seeing gold hit peaks Mm -hmm. The dollar is continuing to stay strong. Yeah. Inflation's coming down. We're going to stabilize the, uh, we're going to go through the recessional period and then we're going to start going up again. Yeah. And when we start going up again, the, the, the problem is going to rear its head again, right? The, the uh, all of a sudden we're going to see a, a, another boom of home values going mm -hmm. up because demand is back into the market and there's not enough supply. And so yeah. we're, we continue to lose, we're, we're still losing on supply. So if we can't get built now, when times are a little bit tougher, we're never going to be able to keep the next run and, of housing and, and Robert, from stopping. We're so into real estate right now, but I actually love this topic. So we're in tough times because interest rates are high and, and people that are sitting on 3% interest rates never want to move because they don't want to lose that interest rate. I get all that, but 
lumber is at an all-time low in cost because why the demand's not high so the the, the price is, has come down it's super low subs subcontractors have to be feeling it in terms of not seeing a lot of new starts happening so the cost for your subcontracting the cost should be coming down there should be some advantages right now mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of material and labor mm -hmm. that we could jump on. And when I say we, I'm not talking government. I'm saying yeah. the free market, yeah. there ought to be people that are staring at this going, yeah, we got the interest rates that are high, but compensating when the interest rates were low, everything else, materials, labor, everything was through the roof. You're seeing those numbers come down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, home starts are up. Um, building permits are up in yeah. Washington County. Right. And so okay. if you're looking at growth and, and yeah. continuing to boom, you're seeing we're, we're we've bottomed out of yeah, the worst so of we it. Should be, we should so we be seeing advantage. some of those opportunities uh, for affordable or for houses that don't cost, that don't have to be as prohibitively expensive as they've been in the past. The mm -hmm. interest rates are a problem, but I think they're even going to, they'll, if, if, if at least politically <laughs> the Fed lowers them to try and help out the, the Democrat administration, I think we'll see the interest rates that'll be coming down at some points here. So I don't know. I, I think I would just rather, I'd love to see the free market uh, find its solutions. And I would love for there to be what you're doing. And that is putting some heads together with whether it, it's your city leaders with your developers, with this common idea of, look, we're, we'll build what's in demand. We'll build what's, you know, this, but there's, there's cost to it and just find some, there has to be common ground on how to do that. Yeah. I, my bigger thing is if we could just get this whole state to see growth, mm -hmm. if we could see the whole, all the counties see opportunity, yeah. then we're spreading out that housing need so far. And that's and, good. And I, I like really, that. really fundamentally believe that would lower the cost of housing Yeah, because you're, you're going in places where the, the costs aren't so high. Yeah. I like so. it. All right, man. All I, right. I got to go to kid's birthday party. Hey, you got to go. Wait. And you got to go play some we, golf. Yeah, we we logged in a long podcast. We did. I did. We it was fun. It. it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, thanks I for like all on, the man. different issues. I so like, uh, no gov internet, internet. If you are a city council member or a part of a city, let's look twice. <laughs> this, this, yep. this, think about this twice. Just think the lanes you're in. Don't get outside your lane and just yep. let that free market let's, do what they let's do. Let's make sure we don't do that. No and, risk uh, capital for tech with taxpayer money. Man, I, I want I want your thoughts more often. So whenever you're in town, yeah, I'd love to. I'd All love right, to man. do it. Thanks, hey, dude. thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. See you guys. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. Make sure you're following us on all the social media websites. We love your support. We love the dialogue. We want to continue that going. Find us at realestate435.com. We'd love to help you find a house here in town or help you get wherever you're going. 